The one thing though that, that I do here is, uh, you know, it'd be great if I was on a two year vacation or three year, I've been traveling now for three years, and I'm not, I'm not on a three year vacation, I'm working all the time. Um, and the assumption is because I have all this freedom, there are no deadlines, right. but there are. There are deadlines, you know, I've got uh, Adorama TV episodes that I need to, to mm -hmm. uh, send regularly. And then I'm writing articles for my blog and other blogs and, and um, those have to be filed. And then um, I've got some, some sponsors and some people that I'm working with on the motorcycle side. So there's always this pressure. And then uh, the other thing on top of that is on a motorcycle, you just can't ride after dark right, because of, of cows and sheep and people and all sure. kinds of things. But it's really, really your chances of having something really bad happen after dark mm -hmm. go up exponentially. Wow. Uh, and so there are many times where I'll see something that's really fantastic. And I have a little computer that says, this is how long you have till sunset, and this right. is how long it's gonna take for you to get to where you're going. Okay. And I realize I have about 10 minutes out of the whole day that I can not be moving. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough time to take this picture. Of course. And then I have to weigh the, the, the price. If I take this picture and get a great image, the chance that I'm gonna have an accident later is pretty darn high. Wow. Is it worth it? Yeah. And most of the times it's not. You know, I was told uh, by uh, an, quite a funny anecdote by um, Another fellow long-distance motorcycle driver, um, his name is uh, uh, Borman. What's his first name? It's Charlie. Charlie Borman. That's Charlie Borman. Yeah. I did, a, I did a, a piece on him a few weeks, a few months ago uh, for one of the newspapers, and uh, he and Ewan McGregor do these trips, great trips through Africa and, and South America, etc. But he was recently in, in South Africa, and he was in Kruger National Park uh, on his bike, but he was told by the rangers he wasn't allowed to ride the bike in Kruger because the lions... Yeah. look at his bike and think it's prey and will attack him for it. Have you ever had that problem? Yes, actually. <laughs> so I didn't go to Kruger because they wouldn't, they don't allow motorcycles mm -hmm. in. But I was in uh, Tanzania riding, um, I rode across, I can't remember the, the park, and I didn't see anything. I just went right, I saw some hippo. Um, and so I went through this park and it was great. And then I went up um, the western side of Tanzania, had to turn around and come back because mm -hmm. it, it was, the roads were rained out. So I was coming back to the same park I'd been through and the ranger stopped me and he said, uh, what are you gonna do if a lion comes out? Wow. And I'm like, I don't know, I'll outrun the lion. I thought he was giving me a hard time, right? Cause I hadn't seen anything. Right. And I didn't think there were lions. And he said, don't stop, don't stop for anything. Right. Like, okay. And um, so I get into the park and this, uh, this pack of Eland, which is like, deer kind of with legs yeah. long horns. They're crossing in front of me, right? So I have to stop. And they're going, there's about, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them, they zip across the road. And as soon as they're done, I see up the road, a lion cross the road. We're talking 50 yards in front of me. Wow. And lion, they don't go by themselves, right? They, they move in prides. Is that what it's called, a pride, yeah. And I, I have to go that way. Mm -hmm. And I hear the guy saying, don't stop, don't stop. And so now, I'm riding toward where I just saw a lion. Wow. And mm. thinking, he doesn't want to eat me. He's after those guys that I just saw, but maybe he will eat me. I don't know. <laughs> and it was rainy and muddy and really bad. So I couldn't mm. even go fast. It was terrifying. I never saw the lion again, by the way. But um, I did have elephant that would stop in the middle of the road wow. in uh, Botswana. And I hope you got uh, the pictures. <laughs> well, I was using... I was using a GoPro, and so unless they're right there, mm. so you see these elephant, and they look tiny, but oh, to my they're like, whoa! Sure. Yeah. I had something well, uh, sort of similar, I suppose, in, in, in British Columbia and Canada a couple of years ago. I was doing a story about um, the coastal grizzly bears, and we approached them with kayaks, a single-person kayaks, and I had a, a monopod mounted in the middle so I could use a longer lens, a 300 mil lens, but we were told by the, by the park rangers that we couldn't get within 50 meters of the bear. Well, as a photographer, you're taught when you're first starting out that you've got to get close, 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 close. That is the mantra that goes through your head. So as I'm in this, this canoe, this little one-person canoe, and I'm slowly paddling and picking up the swells a little bit, it's pushing me a little closer into the, into the shore. And all I can hear in the background is from the ranger saying, Doug, get back, Doug, get back. And I'm like, ah, oh, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know anything. Did so you know this, bears can swim? There's this big female <laughs> grizzly bear on the, on the edge eating some sedge grass with her two cubs. And uh, I'm looking through my 300, trying to get a nice tight headshot. And I'm getting just to that spot where, you know, where I'm close enough to get the image. 
And what does the bear do? The bear comes out into the water after me and I realize I'm about 15 meters away from her and I can hear the guy behind me screaming at me. So I'm trying to put the camera down and back paddle as fast as I can yeah. so this bear doesn't catch me. But I think it's a, it's a problem a lot with, with photographers is that yeah. you, you get lost in what you're doing and you don't listen to anything around you not for the not usually for the be- for the better of yourself. So. Yeah, yeah, the yeah you can die that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So the the gear that you take it looks like so here's mine, and here's yours. Uh, there's quite a difference as far as size, weight, and you know ev- all of my stuff. That's right here. This is everything. That's my entire camera bag, which is about the same size as your camera. Right. Well, you know the Leica stuff is is bar none. The lenses are fantastic. Um, yeah. The Leica stuff is bar none, I think, the, the best for up close uh, photojournalism or reportage. It's just so, uh, I don't know, unobscure, is that a word? You, know, just, you can hide behind it, you can hide it really easily. Yeah. So um, much easier to approach somebody with this. Yeah, definitely. Now, the reason why I've still got, I do have a couple of Leicas, by the way, but I still prefer the DSLRs. Now, main reason for me is, is the autofocus. Um, yeah. I'm getting older and my eyes aren't so great anymore, so I tend to rely a little more on the autofocus unless I'm shooting landscapes and through live view. Um, I like the versatility, the longer lenses, because I do often switch to the, the 70 to 200 and the 300 mil lenses. I do like that about the, uh, the DSLRs. The um, and I still will use two cameras at once, oftentimes. So I'll usually mount a 50 mil and maybe a 24 on here if I'm in markets and such. Um, I think it's just a matter of what you get used to. Um, your, the costs, of course, are, are, are uh, uh, definitely something you have to think about. Um, I personally still like the DSLRs. I know it's a lot of weight to carry, and I do have a bad shoulder because of it. But uh, I think I'm going to stick with the DSLRs for a while yet. Yeah, I mean, this has advantages. Really, it's the size of the camera that did it for me. Um, you know, it's not that much lighter when you pick up a Leica. They're, they're not so light. But uh, the size, the unobtrusiveness, and the, the sharpness, the clarity, the contrast of the lens is unmatched yeah. by any totally manufacturer, yeah. which you can't see in videos. No. You can't see it online. You can't see that until you have a print. Then you can see it. So a lot of comparisons that I've seen on YouTube, mm-hmm. um, well, everything has been you basically yeah, downgraded. Yeah. So you can't yeah. really see it until you see it. And then it's yeah. like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's, there's just a clarity about Leica that... that you don't really get unless you go up to a medium format or bigger. So when people found out about how much this was, I got just tons of emails about the cost. But I've had Mamiya's Hasselblad's, a D4, Nikon D4, 1DX. Never have I heard anybody comment about the price. And those are as much as this. But, you know, this red dot, for some reason to some people, just says it's too much money to be worth it. But for me, it is worth it because of the lenses and the sure. system and, and all sure. of that kind of stuff. Wow, it's a lot to think about. Um, I think we're gonna sign off here. I'm Doug McKinley with Mark Wallace uh, for Adorama TV. Uh, All you travelers out there, I hope you've got some uh, good food for thought and keep traveling.